Welcome, everyone. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started because Facebook might kick us off the live stream for playing music. We did want you to hear the rest of that song, but we'll drop a link to it in the chat um, so you can check it out later on your own. Um, welcome again. My name is Brittany Battle. I am the co-founder of Triad Abolition Project, um, which is a grassroots organization in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And I'm also an assistant professor of sociology at Wake Forest University. I'm so honored and excited for y'all to be joining us tonight, um, for you to take your time to learn more, be introduced to, or dig in with us on abolition as a feminist practice. Um, before we begin, I want to provide a content warning that some of our discussions tonight will include conversations about physical violence, about sexual assault and rape, um, about state violence and trauma. Um, please know that as a collective, we are all holding space for any of you who, for whom these conversations are difficult um, or for whom these experiences are real and not hypotheticals. Um, and we ask that you participate um, in whatever capacity you feel comfortable with to best take care of yourselves. Um, so as y'all know, the title of this teaching is Journeying Toward Liberation. And we are really leaning into the idea that we're on this journey together, that we're struggling together, that we're grieving together, that we're experiencing joy together, all in the service of practicing abolition um, in our everyday lives and of creating a future that's more, that's full of more compassion and more care. And so to this end, this teaching is a collaborative effort of the Forsyth County Police Accountability and Reallocation Coalition, or FC Park, as we call it. Um, FC Park is a grassroots collective of organizations um, local to the Triad region of North Carolina, as well as state organizations from North Carolina as well, which include Triad Abolition Project, Birds, Bees, and Babies, Drum Majors Alliance, Forsyth County Community Bail Fund, Fayetteville PAC, and C-SPAN, and Winston-Salem Democratic Socialists of America. Our coalition has been working together since December on five demands um, for the city of Winston-Salem, for Forsyth County, as well as the state of North Carolina. And you can learn more about those demands as well as the work that we've been doing on the resource list that is going to be shared this evening. So all of the organizations in our coalition move from an abolitionist framework. And just like the journey toward abolition that many of us have been on um, as individuals, our organizations have also navigated similar journeys. Some of us began firmly committed to reforming the criminal legal system, um, while others originated in the spirit of working toward abolition. But at this point, we all recognize the promise and also the urgency of abolition. And in recognizing those things, as well as our journeys as individuals and organizations, we thought that this teaching would be a great way to honor Women's History Month, um, sharing about our journeys and the feminist practice of abolition. So many of you are likely familiar with some of the figures around mass incarceration in the United States, um, including the striking but not surprising figure that the United States has just 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's incarcerated population. And with more than 1 million women behind bars or under the control of the criminal legal system, women are the fastest growing segment of the incarcerated population increasing at nearly double the rate of men since 1985. And we know that prisons and other carceral institutions are sites of extreme violence. Um, for those who are swept up into those spaces, both when they're inside the detention center or the jail or when they're outside in the community, which often um, you know, function as open air prisons. And so that makes these things fundamentally anti-feminist, right? They're fundamentally anti-feminist places. So our practice of, fem of abolition is firmly rooted in feminist traditions, specifically radical Black feminism, which has been guiding the journey to liberation since enslaved Africans fought for their freedom. We are steadfastly against carceral feminisms, which Victoria Law defines as, quote, an approach that sees increasing policing, prosecution, and imprisonment as the primary solution to violence against women. This stance does not acknowledge that police are often purveyors of violence and that prisons are always sites of violence. Carceral feminism ignores the ways in which race, 
class, gender, identity, and immigration status leave certain women more vulnerable to violence. And that greater criminalization often places those same women at risk of state violence, end quote. We instead lean into an abolitionist feminism developed by Dr. Angela Davis and her collective critical resistance. And they offer that as a strategy of, quote, building movements that not only end violence, but that create a society based on radical freedom, mutual accountability, and passionate reciprocity. In this society, safety and security will not be premised on violence or the threat of violence. It will be based on a collective commitment to guaranteeing the survival and care of all peoples, end quote. So just to note, Dr. Davis's book, Abolition Feminism Now, will be out this July, and I strongly encourage folks to pick that up. Um, and so yet, although we're leaning into this um, abolitionist feminist practice, we know that for some, maybe many, um, the very idea of abolishing prisons and police um, might be scary, right? Um, we for so long thought that our only option for maintaining order, right, or not descending into chaos um, and protecting women and femmes, we thought that our only option was 911, right? Was the police, was um, punishment in the form of jail for our abusers. And so in recognizing these fears, I urge you to also consider how scary and how radical and how far-fetched and utopian it likely seemed to end slavery, right? And those folks were leading into abolitionist practices as well. And yet our ancestors, both that those that are known to us and those that are unknown to us persisted in that fight, right? In that journey toward liberation, many giving their lives, sacrificing their children, committing to generations of work to see a different future, right? One that only existed in their imaginations. And so we're trying to engage in a similar struggle. And so since part of the practice of abolition requires knowing what actually the practice entails, I wanted to share with you some nuggets of wisdom that I've picked up along my journey in studying the Black feminists who have been doing this work for generations. These points get at some of the misconceptions, right, or the misunderstandings about what a, a practice of abolition is and what it is not. Okay, so first to the first point, um, abolition, as Ruth Wilson Gilmore reminds us, is not primarily a destructive strategy, right? It's not just about tearing things down. It's about creating, right? It's about strengthening the things that already exist for our good and for our liberation and building the things that do not exist already, right? It's a generative strategy. And having said that, to the second point, it's not about a utopia, though, right? So as abolitionists, we're not ignoring the realities that violence and harm do exist, and they do occur, right? But it, it, it's urging us to rethink how to deal with those things. It's asking us to reimagine safety and justice, right? Moving away from an understanding of justice just as punishment, right? As again, as Ruth Wilson Gilmore points out, quote, it's punishment that leads people to the conclusion in the first instance that the way that you deal with a problem is by killing it, right? That the way that you deal with a problem is by killing it. It's punishment that leads us to that logic. And so in other words, our collective thirst for vengeance, which is natural, given how we've all been socialized in this carceral society, right? And natural as we... It, continuously experience violence against people that look like us, right? Including in the trial of Derek Chauvin that's happening right now. So those are natural feelings, but it's that vengeance, that thirst for vengeance that allow, it's the very logic that allows white supremacist state violence to then be turned, at, turned back on us, right? And enacted against our own bodies. But also in, in not being an idealist practice, abolition also understands that many of us are in constrained situations right now, right? We have constrained choices for safety. So sometimes we may need to use what options we have available to us now, or we may have had to use those options in the past, and that's okay, right? Abolition is not acting, asking for people to be unsafe in this moment, but it is asking us to think bigger, right? To think about what could be. And so also to the third point, abolition does not ignore survivors of harm and violence, right? In fact, it puts those of us who have had these experiences at the center, right? Mo many of us, possibly most of us who practice abolition have experienced some form of violence, right? Whether that's from our loved ones, from our community, um, or from the state or all of the above, right? That some of us have experienced. And from those experiences, we found that police don't actually stop the violence, right? Especially in communities that they care nothing about. 
It's actually police that um, create and reinforce the conditions that make this violence possible, and they are some of the biggest perpetrators and, benefici and beneficiaries of violence, particularly against Black women, Black femmes, and Black trans folks. So to really keep us safe and to support survivors, we have to build stronger community connections. We have to train our communities in intervention methods and mediation methods, right? We have to provide material resources for folks to address the root causes of crime. And we have to have solid transformative, process, transformative justice processes in place for when harm and violence do occur. And having said that, abolition does not require forgiveness. Right, it does not require for you to remain in community with someone who have may who may have hurt you. Um, it doesn't say that there are no consequences, that there are no sanctions for committing harm, but it does require us to rethink how to employ sanctions and how to compel folks to participate in transformative justice processes without perpetuating the violence of the carceral state. And collectives such as Generation 5 and Transform Harm have been thinking about these things, right? They've been doing this work and we can build on the work um, wherever we are in our own communities. And lastly, abolition is not just about anger or hatred of the police or those working in the carceral systems, although those are very perfectly valid emotions and responses to the trauma and violence that we experience, but instead moves from a practice of radical love, right, and a discipline of hope, as Miriam Kaba reminds us. And so here, hope is not just an emotion, and it does not preclude us from experiencing the emotions of anger or sadness or despair or overwhelm, right, but instead a practice of hope inspires us to can, despite those other emotions that we may be experiencing, it inspires us to continue working toward liberation wherever we can, whenever we can, wherever we are, right, however we can. And so to open and ground our time together, I am so excited to um, bring to you Miss Sarah Hines, who has been really the voice of the uprising here in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and it's impossible for you to have attended any direct actions or marches this in the summer of 2020 without hearing her speak. And so she's here to offer a piece of spoken word for us. So, my journey to feminist abolition has cost me blood, sweat, and tears. Compliance just to fit in held me captive and quiet for years. Oppressed and depressed by systems built by patriarchy and white supremacy. I was weighed down by the weight of my infinite blackness and femininity. Living only in the margins, regulated to some kind of blacklist. I stepped out of my box. I knew somehow I had to stop this. Now something inside me kept saying, Sarah, even the score. Huh. Then during this global pandemic, I got shook to my core. By the modern day lynching of Ahmad, Brianna, George, John, and in the past, many, many more. Reality had cracked my veneer of ever suffering in silence. I was moved to abolition, to stop oppression and violence. And just like Sojourner Truth, if they burn it down rather than listen those asses, if they burn it all down, I'll tell my truth to the ashes. And like Harriet Tubman, when I hear them dogs, I just keep running. I keep my eye on the prize. I know justice and freedom is coming. See, I be knocking down walls built by male gaze and male violence. And like the black intersectional feminist Audre Lord, we are powerful because we survived this. And like Angela Davis, I know freedom is a damn constant struggle and I'm pissed. And in the words of our trans sister Laverne Cox, radical is any trans person choosing to be visible in a world that tells us we shouldn't even exist. So you see, abolition is the art of elegant destruction of all racist systems built up during slavery and reconstruction and the reordering of all institutions that thrive off of oppression I'll tear it all to the ground, but build it back better. Now that's the real lesson. 
My name is Sarah and I am a feminist abolitionist, unapologetically. Y'all <laughs> offer some, some love for Miss Sarah. Thank you so much for that powerful piece. Um, as I mentioned, abolition is a long-term project, right? And so we'd love for you to begin struggling um, with abolition as a practice or continue struggling if you're already somewhere in your practice with abolition, figuring out where and how you can begin incorporating um, these practices into your everyday life. And so before we get started, because this is a teach-in and because I'm a professor, I'm gonna have y'all do a quick activity. Um, for the activity, I'd like for us to begin um, by defining to ourselves on a sheet of little scrap paper that you have with you or in the notes, you know, app on your phone or wherever, a couple concepts. And we're all at different places in our own individual journey. So some of us have likely thought about these um, concepts more than others, and that's okay. My hope is that your definitions of these terms might expand or be challenged or be upheld or reinforced in some way over the course of this time. So we'll take three minutes. I know that's not a lot, but we'll take three minutes to define three concepts. They are safety, justice, and community. And so they're terms that are often viewed as foundational to the criminal legal system and they're taken for granted, but rarely clearly articulated or defined, right? So I'm asking you to think through what does safety look like? What does that feel like, right? What does justice mean? What does, what does it mean for someone to get justice? Justice. What does community mean? What do they look like? So what does it feel like to be to exist in community? So we'll take three minutes um, to work on those. Okay, y'all, thanks for joining me with that. I know it wasn't a lot of time, but y'all can hold on to these definitions until the end of the teaching. Um, and so the rest of our journey this evening is going to be divided into three sections. Um, these sections are modeled after a beautiful definition of abolition that was offered by Mage, my comrade and friend, who you'll hear again from later this evening. Um, during an interview about their experiences journeying toward abolition, Mage defined abolition as as consisting of three dimensions. The first being dismantling, right? So that's breaking down the systems which continue to oppress us. The second is existing in community. So struggling with and really thinking through how to be in relationship with one another, right? How to strengthen and build our communities. And lastly, um, dreaming. So that's imagining and then reimagining again and then reimagining again and then reimagining again what liberation means and how we get there. And so as we move through the teaching, 
in each of these sections, I urge you to begin or continue to work through one of the first and most important practices of abolition, and that's abolishing the police in your mind, right? We all have to abolish the police in our own mind. And that police in our, in our own mind is that which upholds our own allegiance to white supremacy, our own allegiances to patriarchy, to capitalism, to homophobia and transphobia, to ableism, right? Allegiances that bring us to police other people's bodies, to silence black women's voices and black trans folks' voices, to engage in respectability po politics, right? To ostracize and harm queer and trans folks, including Lil Nas X, right? To speak ill of our siblings, to ignore the struggles of the unhoused, right? To contribute to the harm and lack of access and visibility for disabled folks, and to ultimately not practice revolutionary love. So we really ask you to begin working through those things, right? And so in each section, we'll begin with a piece of art, which we thought expressed the respective dimension of abolition that we're talking about. And you're going to hear from many powerful women, femmes, non-binary folks, and trans folks this evening, people that I am so honored and grateful to know and to practice abolition alongside. So we begin our discussion of dismantling systems of oppression by offering a dance piece from Nia Sadler with music from Benjamin Pugar. The prompt for this piece was how do we dismantle the police in our bodies and how do we dismantle policing from other people's bodies? All right, hello. Um, my name is Jillian Seacrest and it is an honor to be here today. I am co-chair of Winston-Salem DSA and primarily organized with Housing Justice Now. So um, allow me to go ahead and get into discussing how we can dismantle these systems of oppression and how it relates to abolition as a whole. <clears throat> the Darwin bark spider is a master builder. Their complex webs are a marvel. Webs that span rivers, weaved with their silk, not delicate silk threads, but stronger than Kevlar. Silk that is the toughest biological material to ever be studied. Indigenous Madagascarians have known of their capable craftsmen for generations. Generations of knowledge and lore, generations who are never credited with discovery, generations disacknowledged by Western scientists who claimed the spider was discovered in 2001. Their massive and complex webs call to conscious the same intricate webs essential to systems of oppression. Deadly systems that are as indestructible as Kevlar and require Western discovery over indigenous experience. We as abolitionists are seeking to detangle these webs, to challenge the solutions of punishment within our punitive society, to challenge the prevailing belief that abolition and change is utopian and unattainable, to challenge the belief that we can remedy each system of oppression individually instead of collectively. So when I mention abolitionism within my words, it encompasses any and all systems of oppression because their existence impedes the ability of ab abolition to be actualized. 
To deconstruct, we must first understand that is said by the brilliant Ruth Wilson Gilmore, where life is precious, life is precious. A notion that must be internalized by not just our governments, but our communities and selves before work can begin. In societies where people's needs remain unmet, where there is less investment in healthcare, housing, and community services, you see greater inequalities. Where you see greater inequality, you see higher rates of incarceration and punitive action. When machines and computers, profit motives and property rights are considered more important than people, the giant triplets of racism, extreme materialism, and militarism are incapable of being conquered. The ethos of Dr. King's 1967 speech, Beyond Vietnam, centers the societal corrosion that occurs when we allow life to be deprioritized. Instead of governmental budgets being dictated by the preservation and perpetuation of capital, they should instead focus on the prioritization of life. Radical Black feminists have been and will continue to be critical in the dismantling of these reactive and deadly systems. They unfortunately know the visceral sting of gender-based violence well. Our carceral system both perpetuates violence and ignores the violence perpetuated against Black women, Black femmes, Black trans women, and gender non-conforming individuals. By not centering the voices of Black women, trans women, and gender non-conforming individuals, we fail them. We fail to hear and see the harm that these violent machinations enact against them. As the era of allies continues, many white women labor under the delusion that their feminism is radical, is intersectional, when their feminism isn't even feminism. Feminism is inherently an abolitionist practice. If these women, trans women, and gender nonconforming individuals are not free from violence of police, housing discrimination, job-based discrimination, and other isms based in Western power structures, then none of us are free. As Aboriginal activist Lila Watson said, if you have come here to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. From Marsha P. Johnson to Angela Davis, Mariam Kaba to Miss Major Griffin uh, <laughs> Gracie, excuse me, Black women, Black femmes, and trans women are often the vanguard of this revolutionary practice, a practice that seeks not a seat at the table, but the autonomy to dismantle and reconstruct the table. Reforms and restorative justice further entrench our prison industrial complex, whereas transformative justice seeks to expand our collective imaginations by addressing root causes of sexual violence in lieu of seeking punitive actions that further perpetuate violence. Transformative justice is reliant upon community instead of sta state. <clears throat> Abolitionist Mia Mingus recounted the path to building the Bay Area Transformative Justice Collective, a collective, not a nonprofit, that works to build and sustain transformative justice responses to child sexual abuse. Mia Mingus continues, so part of our work is figuring out what are the conditions that we can build? What kind of conditions can we create that could actually support transformative justice responses to child sexual abuse? Meaning response to child sexual abuse that doesn't rely on the state and that are actively working to cultivate the things that we know will prevent future incidences of child sexual abuse, but any form of violence from happening. And because child sexual abuse is often bound up with lots of different types of violence, we end up working on lots of different types of violence as well. Reimagining the role of community is at the beginning of the path to become an abolitionist. The moment you recognize the wealth and potential of community and collective care, you become Saul on the road to Damascus, blinded by ignorance and healed by truth. You become able to see the value in a shared sense of vulnerability and strength. You are finally able to recognize that collective care and community can effectively treat the issues in lieu of allowing the state to incarcerate. The foundations that have been laid by the multitude of Black women, Black femmes, Black trans women, and gender nonconforming individuals organizing and leading abolition efforts are integral in the path forward. Continuing to elevate their efforts, boost their activism, and cultivate stronger communities and collective care, we can continue the long path forward to abolition a journey whose end will bring down even spider webs stronger than Kevlar. Thank you. That's right, thank you for that, Jillian. Um, so we're gonna to move to our discussion of existing in community now. We're gonna open with a clip from the film Beloved adapted from Toni Morrison's novel of the same name. And I'm going to read this introduction of the piece that was offered from my comrade and friend, brother Terrence Hawkins. So what does it mean to exist in community? authentic community, beloved community, abolitionist community? How do people living under the surveillance and containment of the carceral state 
find the space to truly be together, right? To breathe to, together, to freedom dream together. How can the practice of communal healing and care and transformative justice flourish in the face of systems that hunt, cage, and punish? Beloved community is never gifted by the oppressor, right? But it's violently restricted. And even without physical violence, we know that too often the greatest weapon in the hand of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. In other words, we can never underestimate our ability to reincarnate deadly forms of life together that demand assimilation, not liberation, uniformity, not unity, and hierarchy, not mutuality. And yet Black people, specifically Black women and Black femmes that have a tradition of making a way out of no way, right? Of forming beloved community out of the ashes of injustice. This abolitionist tradition was practiced in what were known as the hush harbors of the antebellum South. The hush harbors were secret and illegal gatherings of enslaved Africans that took place in the woods, away from the, so the, the gaze of the so-called master. There in the brush or what Toni Morrison called the clearing, Black people could be together, we could breathe together, and we could freedom dream together. There we could practice revolutionary love. From the pen of ancestor Toni Morrison in her classic novel Beloved and through the voice of the character Baby Suggs, we get a glimpse of the clearing and what it means to be in, but not of, the carceral state. Here we see the power, the wonder, and the beauty of existing in communities of care, of healing justice, and of radical love. This is the abolitionist's prize. Hey, hey y'all. Um, so my name is Bailey Pittenger, and what I'm going to be speaking on for us today is the intersection of disability justice and abolition. Um, and I'm specifically looking at this intersection as a method of building an existing community, as well as a way of trying to debunk what we can understand as carceral logic. So disability justice is defined as a framework that exists that examines disability and ableism as it relates to other forms of oppression and identity, such as race, class, gender, sexuality, incarceration, and more. Disability justice was created specifically for and by our disabled, queer, and black and brown community to build a community to advocate for and celebrate all bodies. Sins and Valid, a disabled performance community outlines the disability justice framework as one, all bodies are unique and essential, two, all bodies have strengths and needs that must be met, three, we are powerful, not despite the complexities of our bodies, but because of them, and four, all bodies are confined by ability, race, gender, sexuality, class, nation state, religion, and more, and we cannot separate these. Disability justice voices include um, such of the likes as Mia Mingus, Leah Lakshmi, Piafsa Samara Sinha, uh, Liet Ben Moshi, Patty Byrne of Sins Invalid, and many more. And I want to emphasize that their writing and voices are rooted in the work of feminist abolitionists such as Angela Davis, Miriam Kaba, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, Andrea Ritchie, and more. So now I'm going to go over some of the different intersections of um, disability justice and abolition. So to start, disability justice is a movement that is approaching 20 years of existence now. It was, it was a response to disability rights movements that were mostly white and um, at least and in the least they were upholding rights primarily for white people and single issue policy changes that due to the lack of intersectionality with racial justice, we're expanding the scope of harm and continuing the agendas of neoliberalism, incarceration, and capitalism by upholding the status quo. Some disability justice scholars specifically look back at the content, at the context of deinstitutionalization as holding a relationship with decarceration. For example, Liet Ben Moshi argues that quote, incarceration happens not only in prisons, but also in other sites of carceral enclosure, such as psychiatric hospitals, detention centers, nursing homes, and residential institutions. 
She goes on to claim that, quote, deinstitutionalization is not an unrelated and inconsequential phenomenon to issues of decarceration and abolition, but one with historical, contemporary, and tactical significance. And what she's referring to historically is that back in 1955, the state mental health population was over half a million, nearly as large as the per capita basis as the prison population is today. Disability rights activists had managed to change policy and culture to the point that mental health population was the mental health population that was institutionalized in the US dropped to under 100,000 by the year 2000, which is due to the statewide closures of psych facilities and residential institutions for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So moving on to the next slide. The disability justice framework partnered with this understanding of the connection between deinstitutionalization and decarceration requires the abolition of prisons and policing. And by drawing on the history of deinstitutionalization, disability justice provides extensive evidence that reforms actually expand the incarceration system and scopes of harm. Prisons and policing are state sanctioned violences on all bodies, but especially our black and brown community members. Disability justice and abolition share the work of care logic, which counters carceral logic and that care leads to community led harm reduction initiatives that build the alternatives to policing and incarceration. In our own community of Winston Salem, I'd like to highlight the work of Unity Wellness Center, which was co founded by our very own Sarah Hines, which is a collaborative care space offering free mental health care services within the community and it's opening a physical location this summer in East Winston. Also, I'd highlight Birds, Bees, and Babies, a member of FC Park, which is a doula service offering reproductive justice care and advocacy for the community. And also, some of the demands of FC Park are disability justice and abolitionist, because they include the demand for our city and county to create a police diversion model of a mobile mental health crisis unit that would respond to mental health crises that are signaled by 911 without the presence of police. In addition, all calls to defund the police are initiatives to change our cultural culture of carceral logic. We must defund the police like we defunded psych wards, which is by creating community-led care initiatives that would address root causes of harm and violence. And it must be done by coming together and building more community-led initiatives for care. Lastly, I'll emphasize again that incarceration does not just happen in penal lo locales looking beyond jails, detention centers, and prisons to also rehabilitation, nursing homes, treatment centers, and psychiatric hospitals. Disability justice frameworks teach us how to individually know and unknow our own individual attachments to carceral logics, which also include the stigmas attached to disability labels. What we can work on individually is understanding that disability is social and cultural. And so we can reclaim words like crip and mad to celebrate our social and cultural differences. By understanding that some of us are born disabled, become disabled, have visible disability, or and have hidden disability, our access towards building the disability community with its differences, complexities, and ever-growing traits becomes an act of resistance to the carceral logic that silences and isolates, thus confines and shames the community. And because there's so much information to share on these intersections between disability justice and abolition um, as ways of existing in community, these infographics, as well as a few more with resources, um, will be shared on social media platforms to help with accessing the information, as well as providing more resources for building ways of knowing and unknowing. So up next is Julie Brady from the Forsyth County Community Bail Fund, and she'll speak on more actions to engage with as methods of building community and radical love with our incarcerated siblings. Hello all, thank you Bailey for that intro. Uh, like she said, my name is Julie Brady. I'm with the Forsyth County Community Bail Fund. I'll be talking about ways in which we can show solidarity with incarcerated people. Um, so I'm gonna talk very quickly because I have limited time. Uh, so I apologize in advance. I want to start off really broad kind of at the top who are incarcerated people there are friends there are loved ones there are family about one in 100 people in america lives in jail or prison and that's pre-trial or post-conviction um, these people are disproportionately poor male and non-white although like dr battle said earlier tonight the growth rate of female imprisonment has been twice as high as that of men um, i think since 1980. 
Over half the women incarcerated in state prisons have a child outside under the age of 18. That's about 60% of women who have a child under age 18 in state prisons. They're also likely to be survivors of violence themselves and are at huge risk for greater violence by prison guards and employees. Meanwhile, on the outside, about 70% of women with incarcerated loved ones are their family's head of household and sole income earner. And so then what is solidarity is? We in the biz like to say uh, solidarity is a verb. It's something you do to help make someone else's journey a little bit easier so that we can all arrive at the same destination whole. So moving on to the next slide, um, you've heard a lot about Miriam Kaba today and that's because she is amazing. Um, she's one of the most prominent an abolitionist in the country, and she has very conveniently for me uh, curated this list of nine solidarity commitments to and with incarcerated people for 2021. Um, she has been doing this for much longer than I have, so uh, I thought I would defer to her on this list. Uh, just some generosity by me. So number one, I'm just going to go through this, learn some basics about incarceration and criminalization. Um, I think that logging on to events like this is a really good first step. Um, if there's any silver lining of COVID, it's that events like this are more accessible than they've ever been. People have access to more diverse um, and more interesting speakers than they ever have before. Um, I don't think that this is a step that really ever truly ends. I think that we should always be trying to learn more about incarceration and criminalization, but I do think it's just super important to understand how criminalization of poverty and incarceration interlock and how those things interlock with capitalism and just our general cultural moment that we're in. Number two is writing at least six letters to an incarcerated person in 2021. Um, we do have a local prison letter writing group there called the Prisoner Outreach Initiative. I believe that a link is being dropped in the chat. Um, I will say that when you look at kind of prison pen pal websites, if you're looking for people um, outside of Winston-Salem, outside of Forsyth County, it's, it's overwhelmingly male on those websites, probably because it's a disproportionately male population. Um, but in the interest, in the spirit of this event, I would encourage you to seek out um, women and specifically black women to write to because I am sure that they get written to less um, based on their underrepresentation on those kind of websites. Make at least four donations of any amount to incarcerated people's commissary accounts in 2021. I like this one a lot because it's so helpful. Um, prison food and jail food is not like nutritious or good or like enough to eat for most adults. So a lot of them have to supplement their diets through commissary. Um, also, people who menstruate have to spend money on hygienic products in commissary accounts um, because oftentimes those products are hard to find in jails and prisons. So in the chat, we have the Black Inmate Commissary Fund out of Atlanta, Georgia, who um, coordinates donations to Black inmates. Um, and going back to that stat I said earlier about how 70% of women with incarcerated loved ones are their family's head of household and sole income earner, this is a great way to help ease the financial burden of these women as well who have loved ones inside. Because when you pay for a commissary account, you're, you're helping the individual who is incarcerated, but you're also helping ease the financial burden on the loved ones that they have waiting for them. So I really like number three. Number four is join at least four phone zaps for improved conditions inside or for individual prisoners in 2021. Um, there's been a lot of these since COVID started um, because so many prisons and jails are doing a terrible job at you know, being humane even before COVID, but now especially that COVID has hit. Um, I know that Triad Abolition Project has organized some of those. Um, Prisoners Outreach has, the bail fund signed on. I'm sure that this is the kind of thing that's going to be continuing um, even after COVID because as long as prisons and jails exist, there's going to be inhumane conditions inside them and there will always be something to, to call and protest about. Number five is send four books to incarcerated people in 2021. Um, I like this one a lot because Access to literature, as you can probably imagine, is not super great um, in the carceral system. Some, some jails and prisons don't even have libraries, so it's really hard to kind of access this kind of um, information, either educational or entertainment. So I'd highly recommend doing that. Um, number six, donate to at least one bail fund in 2021. Um, oh yeah, and I see in the chat, there's the North Carolina Women's Prison Book Project, which is exactly what it sounds like. Um, I like the bail fund one because I run a bail fund. Um, may I humbly suggest donating to the Forsyth County Community Bail Fund? Um, no bias here, but if you're not in Forsyth County, um, I highly encourage you to look up your local bail fund. Um, there should be a link to the National Bail Out, which I wanted to shout out because um, they're kind of tied into the, the history of modern um, community bail funds and that they started off with doing like pop-up events. Um, you might've heard of the Black Mama's Bailout. Um, I think it was also in Atlanta. Um, so those were kind of like pop-ups to try to bail out Black mothers for Mother's Day. So um, I really appreciate the work that the National Bailout was doing um, and they are still active to this day. 
So number seven is visiting an incarcerated person at least once. Um, obviously this is COVID permitting. Um, I think it can be really good for someone who's never been in a prison or jail to do this, to see what it's like, um, at least on the outward facing you know, front of prisons and jails. Uh, I know that our local jail here has not been accepting public visitation since I think last March, which is a, just a wild amount of time to not be able to see your loved ones. Um, so we're looking forward to the day that that opens back up. Number eight is read two books about criminalization in 2021. Um, there are so many options here. Um, there's Not a Crime to be Poor, The Crim Criminalization of Poverty by Peter Edelman. There's um, We Do This Till We Free Us by Marion Cabo, which just came out. It's an abolitionist um, book, but you can't really talk about abolition without talking about criminalization as well. And the perk of this one is that once you are done with these two books, you can send them to people who are inside. And then those people can then read them themselves and then share them with other people. And then finally, make a monthly call, send a monthly email to your governor demanding mass release of incarcerated people through clemency. All governors have this power. They can do it whenever they want. Um, they just don't. They just don't. Um, so it's been really infuriating kind of during the pandemic. Um, there's so many people in every single state that have evidence pointing to their innocence or they are you know, especially vulnerable to COVID or they've been in for a long time and like just aren't gonna hurt anyone. Um, so it's, it's very frustrating watching 50 people who have this unique power to send people home to their loved ones during a pandemic, um, just not using that power. So that's all I have. Um, I want to thank everyone who's logged on to this right now because that's the kind of thing that makes me hope for the future that people are, are interested in seeing this kind of thing. So thank you all. Thanks so much, um, Bailey and Julie, for everything that y'all shared in, in getting us thinking about how we can exist in community. Um, and so lastly, we move to our discussion of dreaming. And so this um, section is going to be open with a reading of Octavia Butler's novel Wild Seed from my comrade and friend, Soraya Chestnut. All right, um, can everyone hear me? Okay, all right. As we dig into the works of Octavia Butler, I want to leave you with the words from Octavia Butler herself. Um, quote, these novels are not prophetic. These novels are cautionary tales. These novels are, if we are not careful, you know, if we carry on as we have been, this is what we might wind up with. You have to think about what kind of world you want to live in. And I don't think there's a person alive who wants to live in the world that I've written about. But we can arrange it. The problems that I write about are problems that we can do something about. That's why I write about them. And throughout all of the works by Octavia Butler, there's one common theme that we just cannot deny, and that is hope. In the dystopian oppressive world, there will always be a dream of liberation, a possibility for another world. This excerpt from Wild Seed by Octavia Butler is gonna paint a picture of the power struggles between two opposing immortal forces. As I read this passage, I encourage you to imagine that you are a Nyanwa, the immortal shapeshifter who uses her abilities to seek autonomy, community, and freedom in an oppressive world. This world is dominated by the immortal antagonist, Doro, whose desire for power and control often contrast with Anyanwa's unchained mindset. Anyanwa's story is a prime example of the fight Black women go through with gender and racial oppression while still trying to preserve our humanity. Now I'm going to read this excerpt from Wild Seed by Octavia Butler. Uh, briefly, she wondered how long she could endure being away from kinsmen, from friends, from any human being. How long would she have to hide in the sea before Doro stopped hunting her or before he found her? She remembered her sudden panic when Dora took her from her people. She remembered the loneliness that Doral and Isaac had her two now dead grandchildren had eaten. How was she standing along among the dolphins? How was it that she wanted to live so badly that even the life under the sea seemed precious? Dora had reshaped her. She had submitted and submitted and submitted to keep him from killing her, even though she had long ago ceased to believe what Isaac had told her, that her longevity made her the right mate for Dora, that she could somehow prevent him from becoming an animal. He was already an animal. But she had formed the habit of submission and her love for Isaac and for her children. And in the fear, and in her in her for the fear, sorry, in her fear of death, especially of the kind of death Dora would inflict. She had given in to him again and again. Habits were difficult to break. The habit of living, the habit of fear, even the habit of love. Where her children were men and women now, able to care for themselves. She would miss them. No feeling was better than that of being surrounded by her own, her children and grandchildren and great grandchildren. She could never have been content moving constantly as Dora moved. It was her way to settle and make a tribe around her and stay within that tribe for as long as she could. Would it be possible, she wondered, to make a tribe of dolphins? 
would Doyle give her the time she needed to try? She had committed what was considered a great sin among his people. She had run away from him. It would not matter that she had done so to save her life, that she could have seen he meant to kill her. After all her submission, he still meant to kill her. He believed it was his right to squander among his people. A great many of his people also believed it, and they did not run when he came for them. They were fighting, but he was their God. Running from him was useless. He invariably caught the runner and killed him, or very rarely brought him home alive and chastised him as proof to others that there was no escape. Also, to many, running was heretical. They believed that since he was their God, it was his right to do whatever he chose with them. Job, she called them in her thoughts, like the Job of the Bible. They admitted the best of their situation. They could not escape Doro, so they found virtue in Almost virtue in nothing that had to do with him. She had never, he had never been her God, and if she had to run for a century, never stopping long enough to build the tribe that brought her too much comfort, she would do it. He would not have her life. The people of Whitley would see that he was not all powerful. He would never show himself to them wearing her flesh. Perhaps others would notice his failure and see that he was no God. Perhaps they would run too. And how many could Doro chase? Surely some would escape and be able to live their lives in peace with only ordinary human fears. The powerful ones like Isaac could escape, perhaps even a few of her children. She put away from her the memory that Isaac had never wanted to escape. Isaac was Isaac, set apart from other people and not to be judged. He had been the best of all her husbands, and she could not even attend his funeral rites. Thinking of him, longing for him, she wished she had kept her birds one longer. She wished she had found some solitary place, some rocky island perhaps, where she could mourn her husband and her daughter without being for her own life, where she could think and remember and be alone. She needed time alone before she could be a fit companion for other creatures, but the dolphins had reached her. Several approached, chattering incomprehensibly, and for a moment she thought they might attack her, but they only came to rub themselves against her and become acquainted. She swam with them and none of them molested her. She fed with them, snatching passing fish as hungrily as she had eaten at the finest food the wheat made in her homeland. She was a dolphin. If Dora had not found her an adequate mate, he would find her an adequate adversary. He would not enslave her again, and she would never be his prey. Thank you, Soraya, for that reading. Yes, thank you. So I'm Nia, I use they, she pronouns. And I'm going to introduce and talk about transformative justice and safety. And I want to do a trigger warning again, because we're going to get into intimate relationship violence, rape, child sexual abuse, sexual assault, murder, all of the things people think about when you think about harm. Um, and I'd like to credit Barnard Center for Research on Women and Project Nia for their series on YouTube about this. So Terrence, you can drop, drop those links in the chat for folks, because that's what I used for this. And Maren Kaba's Transform Harm website designed by Lou Design Studios and dialogues with my community in FC Park and TAP. So like everyone just thank you. So let's jump in. We have been socialized to think that punitive justice from the state is okay and like that's going to do nothing. And being removed from community, shamed, and then further harmed by being placed in prison or on probation, which is also state surveillance, is enough. That's not enough. Uh, we want to seek revenge, vengeance. We want to inflict the same harm we received. Um, think, um, things like giving someone a taste of their own medicine or an eye for an eye, or in terms of state violence or state sanctioned murder, the death penalty. And our, our brains immediately go to murderers, rapists, abusers, like the extremes, the crisis mode. And we're gonna take a step back and talk about what the the basis is for transformative justice and it means that what if we reimagine the system in which the harm inflicted isn't possible which is how agent marie brown and a lot of other people describe it what if you attack the root cause of the system or the root of the system and we recognize or tj as, as i'll say <laughs> recognizes that harm doesn't happen in a vacuum so what circumstances led to this event or harm as Saban kelly says what environment enabled this pattern to continue and why did folks not intervene before the behavior worsened what steps did we miss along the way that led to this extreme ordeal or even a small ordeal and those circumstances do not take the place of accountability and we know that the system we have perpetuates harm and does not reduce harm. So those entities also don't center survivors' needs, which is what transformative justice and restorative processes work. 
responsibility in us. And also consider that we are all harm doers in some fashion and multiple realities can exist at once. Like, for example, these are two examples that Adrienne Marie Brown gives in one of the videos linked in the, dropped in the chat. So she says, okay, you're a harm doer, you've experienced harm and now you have caused more harm. That's one. The next one is censuring survivors' needs and holding them accountable when they want something punitive or driven by shame. So like, does the survivor want to like blast their name on social media and say, you, you, you are abusers and you, you, you need to go away? Um, and does the survivor feel like they want their power back? Do they want to feel that power again, take it back? Things to consider or just know that we're, we're moving away from shame and punitive actions. Okay, third warning again, child sexual abuse. So one of the links dropped in the chat is an article from Pamone Felix, who is a survivor of sexual, child sexual abuse and an abolitionist. And the article that's in there is Aching for Abolition. And in it, she really just describes her journey to abolition through this harm, through this experience. And I'm just gonna read two quotes. They're pretty short from Kamon. If we wanted to protect rape victims and serve survivors, our systems would attack harm and its causes at the root. It would center its solutions in harm reduction and transformative justice and restorative processes of accountability and move away from punitive solutions that do nothing to stop assault from happening. Okay, the next one is about needs. A, com a commitment to ending harm is a commitment to providing housing, food, employment, free education and extensive trauma-informed mental health care. Many of us don't have these needs met, like a lot, a very large majority of us. And even before the pandemic, we didn't have those needs met. And now the pandemic has exacerbated that lack. So just again, we're dreaming, dream of a space in which all of your social, emotional and material needs are met. What does it look like? And it is possible, it is. It's also anti-capitalistic, but um, know that th that exists in th those things. When your needs are met, it might just reduce harm. Again, we know that harm still happens, but if your needs are met and we're, uh, if we're engaging in community accountability, those things are reduced and we don't have to rush to crisis. Okay, so I also need to emphasize that transformative justice happens outside of the state and schools. Okay, outside of the state, community-based. Sarah Hassan says, you can take the values into school or broader in institutional work, but it cannot be another systemic response. It's community-based. Communities who have been engaging in this work before it had a name were sex workers, disability justice folks, queer trans folks, black and indigenous folks. Marginalized communities understand that the state is not going to help them or center their needs. Um, so how do we do this every day? How do we engage in transform justice every day and abolition every day? So Mia Mingus says it starts with basic communication skills and even taking accountability for the small things. She uses like an agenda example, like, oh, sorry, I didn't send the agenda. Here it is now, boom, boom, boom. You just say, I didn't do it. Now I've done it, boom. Good apologies. So performative apologies are driven by shame. When you feel shame or embarrassed, you're like, oh, I'm sorry, it's whatever, I'll do whatever. And it's that's not a good apology. And is that even what the survivor wants? Consent, oh my goodness, if we just practiced consent, and I think about children a lot when a parent is like, go give that family member a hug or a kiss, and it's like, oh my God, I didn't even, did I say that I wanted that? Um, accountability, help and support, help support each other to heal and take every opportunity we have to stop generational cycles of harm and violence. Okay, yes. Accountability is not punitive, I think I said that. It's not punishment, it's not meant to make you feel attacked. I have an example here. So if you call out a white person for racism or a racist comment or racist behavior, it's not meant to make them feel some sort of way, but for you to acknowledge, for you, the harm doer, you to acknowledge your harm and create a care plan that centers the needs of those you harmed. Yeah, so I'm thinking about that, thinking about all of that. Um, and we, we have to dream and create and embody in a reality where our needs are met. 
So when we rush to crisis, again, we miss the small sustainable things. Okay, I think all of the, the links were dropped in the chat. I'm gonna move to Mage. Mage is gonna talk to us about rest because we need to sit down. Okay, Mage, take it away. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Mage. I use they, them, he, him, sib, fam, homie pronouns. And I'm here to talk about rest as it pertains to abolition work because rest is super important. And so I'll just start us off with a liturgy that I wrote um, from a worship service um, from this past year. Are you prepared to live in a world that you've never even seen before? A world that you've never tasted, smelled, or touched before? A world that only exists within the fondest of your dreams and in the secret caresses of your imagination? Are you prepared for a world where everyone has a safe place to lay their head at night? Are you prepared for a world where everyone can migrate across borders without one security checkpoint in sight? Are you prepared for a world where Black people can breathe with the full expanse of their lungs and experience joy and abundance and without reservation? Are you prepared for a world where trans and queer folks can vogue and sashay in these streets leading us into a world that embraces constant transformation? Are you prepared for a world where community gardens replace prisons permanently and police are rendered obsolete? Are you prepared for a world where people aren't solely defined by their rap sheet? Are you prepared for a world where mutual aid is a given and everyone gets their needs met, no questions asked? A world where we ain't gotta lift up any more prayers. We could just put up deuces, crawl into our beds and just rest. Are you prepared to live in a world that exists beyond the most expansive of imaginations? Are you prepared to be who you are, who you really are, your fullest and most abundant self without limitations, restrictions or confinement? If I told you that that world was coming tomorrow, would you be prepared to live it right now? As someone who is deeply, deeply passionate and committed to abolition work, a question that I ask myself often is this, why is it so, so, so hard for people to imagine a world without pain, suffering, prisons, or police? Why is it so hard for us to do this, to exist without healthy models of reconciliation to actually hold folks accountable to hold and cherish and value each and everybody that steps into space what's not clicking what's not happening what are we not doing what are we missing and it wasn't until i read a quote from this amazing organization called the nat ministry that it really really clicked with me and i'm just going to share this quote with y'all so that we can get on the same page and the quote reads like this our lack of imagination is intimately tied to our sleep deprivation. How can we imagine a world without police and injustice if we can't imagine resting for 30 minutes a day? We must be subversive and reimagine rest. Our creation of liberation, our creation of a liberation world depends on our collective rest. Just go lay down. Friends, family, siblings and saints, we are not resting. We are not resting. And because we are not resting, we are not dreaming. And because we are not dreaming, we are finding it hard to imagine that a whole life, a whole world of thriving, limitless possibilities exist out there. Because you see, to dream is to tap into the deepest crevices of our imaginations, Dreaming is how we tease out our most sacred hopes and dreams and visions. It's where the impossible becomes possible. To imagine a new world, to imagine a new way of life, to imagine new ways of being completely different from what we've been taught, we must be willing to dream. And in order to dream, we must be willing to practice radical rest practices that we've been taught are impossible. We cannot depend on suffering burnout and pain to fuel our dreams. We must find other sources of healing to fuel our movements. We are too used to models of organizing that center pain, suffering, exhaustion, 
grind culture, martyrdom, and a lack of boundaries. Organizing can be difficult and hard, but it should not kill you. It should not harm you. It should not imprison you. It should not convince you that there is no room for rest. When you organize from a space of exhaustion and suffering, you are centering white supremacy. When you organize from a space of grind culture, you center capitalism. When you organize from a pain, a space of pain, you center ableist systems of oppression. In order to properly dream, we need to rest in radical ways. We need to center and prioritize rest in our work instead of pushing it to the sidelines as if it were some side of main side dish instead of the main entree. What does this look like? Prioritizing rest in our organizing spaces, scheduling off days, working in shifts, delegating work, integrating at least one minute of rest into the organizing meeting, encouraging other to rest more, unlearning the idea that rest is impossible, asking different questions. Why, instead of why am I not working hard enough? Ask yourself, am I tired? Am I hungry? Do I feel supported? Am I joyfully and adequately motivated? Am I resting? What would it look like if we organized fully rested? What would organizing look like if we fought with joy in our hearts? What if I organized knowing that my greatest dream wasn't to work a nine to five, but to lay up in some grassy field somewhere, lazy as fuck, sipping on my favorite iced tea, wearing my favorite fitted t-shirt, soaking up the song for as long as I wanted to. A feminist practice of abolition is understanding that these systems don't give a fuck about us and when unapologetically shove emotional, physical, spiritual, and mental labor upon us, so much so that it's killing us. And the crippling weight of emotional, physical, and mental labor is a part of our oppression. It is part of the system that we need to abolish. So to rest, to really, really rest, we need to be willing to abolish the prisons that we place around our imaginations the prisons that prevent us from dreaming, the prisons of exhaustion, the prison of grind culture, the prison of perpetual harm that we willingly cause for ourselves when we tell ourselves that rest is not an option for us in this work. If anything, rest is more than an option. It is a mandate if we are to dream up our greatest and wildest possibilities. To end my time, I will end with one final quote from Trisha Hersey, the founder and Bishop of the Nat Ministry. Ease is your birthright. Hold on and rest. I struggled so hard and I have made so many videos trying to talk about in like 90 seconds why abolition as a feminist practice resonates with me then my sweater came in today and what is more personal and more honest about like my belief than the sweater which says more midwives defund the cops have a nice day scholar ruth wilson gilmore tells us that abolition is not about absence or the things that should not be abolition is about presence what do we hope to see and how do we bring it about? And this is what inspires and fuels me as an abolitionist. As an African and Asian American person of color and the mother of a son who is also half Latino, I know, have always known, and been acutely aware of the tenuous value our lives are worth in this, our home country. And as a mother, I will fight to end all vestiges of a system that means to do harm in any and all forms to my son. My name is Desiree. Hey everyone, my name is Karen. My name is Katie Morowski and I am an abolitionist feminist. I was loosely acquainted with the concepts of abolition and generally on board, at least with reform. Um, but I did have my doubts about completely um, doing away with the carceral system. I first became involved with Triad Abolition Project this summer when they began their uh, occupation of Bailey Park to bring awareness to the murder of John Neville. Um, after that nearly 50-day occupation, um, I got to spend so much time with very passionate, intelligent, um, 
and driven activists and um, basically became a complete convert to um, and a believer in the abolition of the carceral state in its entirety. Working as a journalist covering the unjust slaying of John Neville at the Forsyth County Detention Center and in the Occupy Winston-Salem movement, um, it really opened my eyes to what abolition is and what it could look like if we all truly decolonized our minds um, and rethink how our current system, which is the prison industrial complex, doesn't work, isn't sustainable, and quite frankly, it's cruel. I had always been an activist and passionate about social justice, but I was not able to fully grasp abolition until I met and joined this community of activists and abolitionists. The Triad Abolition Project was the bridge into full abolition for me. As I read, studied, and met community members doing the work of transformative, restorative, and healing justice, the possibilities for the world I had always hoped to raise my son in became real. They suddenly felt possible. When I became a mother, the focus was no longer on fighting for what I believe to benefit my own generation, but to ensure that my son and generations that come after his are never again prevented or limited in their choices, but are given the opportunity to go and do whatever they dream and hope for. I've gotten beautiful glimpses into what the world can and should be modeled in sweet, deep, and true community. And often it's modeled and fostered by fellow feminist abolitionists whether they would give themselves that title or not. And it's these women of the past, the present, and the future that keep me grounded and lifted in love and hope and make the struggle to get in where we want to go well worthwhile. Feminism is an abolitionist practice because if you truly believe that all femmes deserve equal rights and access and health care and housing and food, then you're going to abolish the systems that's preventing all fans from getting their basic needs and their rights. In a country where our prisons are privately owned, the incentive is not to find non-punitive ways to address the ills of our communities, but to gather and enslave as many of those they deem less than to make the prisons as profitable as possible. As a birth worker, to cut it to y'all real clear and concise. The hospital is to black women what the police officer in the jail is to black men. And bigger than that, this very field is lineage work to me. It, be it belongs to my people and the people of this land. But colonization robbed it from the poor and turned it into this industry that it is today. And now people do not have access to the very people who were originally members of the community. The prison system is nothing more than a money-making, forced labor, oppressive, dictatorial entity. In its current form, primarily to inhibit the growth of black and brown power. If we continue down a path that we have learned is destructive, we limit our overall potential as humans. The concept of the carceral system limits our potential as humans and holds us back on a fundamental level. Well, abolition means a lot to me because as someone who's had incarcerated family members and who's had loved ones, you know, killed and brutalized by police, it shows me that I have stake, I have skin in this game. You know, like feminism, abolition is a woman-led movement, um, and it just shows that kind of incarcerating people doesn't only affect them, and, but truly affects their loved ones around them, like their mothers, their wives, their sisters, significant others. Um, you know, etc. I also began to realize that although defunding the police and abolishing the prison industrial complex on its surface seems destructive, that at its core, abolition work is life-giving and restoring. 
and um, it's about not only reimagining what our cultural concept of crime is, but also addressing the root causes of harm in our communities, such as food and housing insecurity, education and health inequities, and of course, um, harm that's perpetuated by the state itself. Um, it's about imagining ways to build communities where we are accountable to each other and we provide true safety and care instead of cages and control. And I am so grateful to be a part of that um, here in my own city of Winston-Salem and beyond. Abolition embraces accountability. It is not just about defunding the police. It is about rebuilding our communities. As a doula, I believe there is nothing more important than the community. I don't, I don't want to do it all by myself, but that's not what people hire me for. People hire me as another set of hands, as another set of eyes, as a member of their circle. And if we defunded the police, we would have a lot more room for improving birthing outcomes and getting our midwives that are legal midwives, not CNMs like you have to be in North Carolina. Anyway, I, I really can talk about all of this all day. There is goodness that we've tasted and seen, but there's so much more, and we're building our way there to freedom, to thriving, to mutual care and community, and we're removing whatever dares stand in our way. The struggle to dismantle our country's elimination-focused penal system didn't begin with my generation or my parents' generation or my grandparents' generation. So understand why there's no more patience to be had. Too many black and brown lives have been lost under the guise of reform. Now is the time for abolition. You're gonna abolish white supremacy. You're gonna abolish the police. You're gonna abolish the patriarchy. Because all of these systems prevent black femmes especially from reaching self-actualization. And when black femmes are free, all femmes are free. Say it with me. When black femmes are free, all femmes are free. Period. So I am going to end us with a benediction to kind of close out our time um, before Brittany um, ends with some final remarks for our teaching. And I'm just going to invite everyone to take a deep breath in and a deep breath out. Deep breath in. Deep breath out. Breathe in abundance and breathe out pain. What does safety look like? What does justice mean? What does it feel like to exist in community? What does your abolitionist world look like? Take a second to breathe it all in and reflect. Are you dismantling? Are you existing? Are you dreaming? Is the grass green? Does your laughter ring across valleys? Are your loved ones with you? Does love shine through your favorite window? Are your ancestors smiling? Deep breath in. Deep breath out. May your greatest abolitionist dreams come into fruition and may you be deeply loved and cherished on your journey towards freedom. Ashe. Jay, thank you, Mage. Um, so in closing, I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight, both those who are live in the webinar with us and those who are streaming. 
um, on Facebook and those who will check this video out, video out later. Um, I also have to thank some folks who, I wanna thank everyone who was on this call and this panel tonight, folks who contributed to the testimonial video that you watched, and also some other folks who did a lot behind the scenes to help us put this together, including Sham, Sam Schaefer, Bobby Danger, Dr. Felicia Ariaga, and Brother Terrence Hawkins. As we part ways tonight, I ask a couple things. I ask that you dig into that resource list that we provided. Um, I ask that you think about ways that you can get involved, right? Including by supporting the organizations that are represented here tonight or finding organizations that are local to your area, wherever you are. And lastly, I'm asking you to hold on to these two quotes from Dr. Angela Davis, whose likeness graced our flyer for this evening and who is one of the most profound abolitionist voices of our time. And I ask that these two quotes be your call to action. She says, you have to act as if it were possible to radically transform the world, and you have to do it all the time. During the coming period, our primary job will be to build community, to create community in ways that allow us to understand that the work that we do now does matter. Even if we cannot see it in an immediate sense, the consequences of the work that we are doing, it will matter eventually. And so that will close. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Take care.